Hi everyone, this is Dr. Blake Bloxham from Beller and Bloxham Medical, and I'm here today uh, to do a pretty exciting video. So this is the final update on our first uh, little observational study with the drug vertiporfin. Uh, I'm going to make this a quick update today. I know I say that every time, but this one I think really will be quick. So if you're watching this video and you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, do not start here. I'm going to put links to all the other vertiporfin videos in the description of this video. Watch those ones first so it makes sense. Uh, if you are here to watch hair transplant videos and you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the end, uh, excuse me, a little bit about that at the end as well. But for now, let's jump into this final update. So for those of you who have been following the little trial here, you'll know that initially I had three patients that enrolled and we did slightly different things uh, with their donor area with different doses of vertiporfin, different applications of vertiporfin, etc. And um, two of the patients I was able to get pretty good follow-up on, and the third patient, who is a great guy, um, ended up, after we did his procedure, sort of moving to a new level in his job. And he has a very cool, kind of classified uh, position, and he was moved to an area where communication just wasn't possible. We'll leave it at that. And I uh, barely heard back from him. It was really hard to communicate. And after I did the last update, I had mentioned this. I said, you know, I waited. I totally understand, but we weren't able to get him in for this last update. Hopefully we will in the future. And lo and behold, like two weeks after I put that up, he said, hey, and sent me a, a, a single picture. So I only have one picture and just a few quick text messages before he had to go back and do his thing. But I want to get into that now. So this last patient, um, I think, was a, a very cool uh application of vertiporfin, a very cool potential thing we were testing here. Because remember that vertiporfin, in regard to hair surgery, we're not only looking at its ability to kind of regenerate things, but we're also looking at how it can affect scarring. That's sort of, you know, initially what uh, the, the drug was being looked for in this instance. Um, now, this patient that I tested it on was what we call a, a hypertrophic scar. So he is a guy that just naturally heals wider. You know, you get, if you do FUT surgeries, um, or even FUE surgeries, but if you do a lot of FUT surgeries, you get maybe a couple of these a year where they're guys um, where you can do everything, you know, to the letter, do a multiple layer closure, do everything beautiful, and these guys just heal wider. It's just their physiology. And when I get these guys, um, what I typically tell them is, look, you know, this is, is physiology. Um, let's not cut it out and close it again because that's often what they they want to do is they say let's just excise this close it again see if it heals better and in some instances that is a good approach in other instances like this these naturally hypertrophic scars it's not a good approach you know we want to do other things like putting grafts into the scar um, doing that maybe plus some scalp micropigmentation things like that so if this patient who had had prior FUT surgery came to me and said um, hey will you cut the scar out and close it again I'll pay whatever you want I would say no and I would say this because it would heal up the same way. There's nothing I could do. There's nothing Dr. Feller could do, Dr. Lindsay could do. You know, anybody could do, in my humble opinion, I'm not saying I'm the best in the world, but I'm just saying, there's nothing that anybody could have done to change this patient's outcome when it comes to cutting out and closing. And I see this a lot. I see patients that um, have a procedure done at a hair transplant doctor's office. They're not pleased with the scar. They go to different hair doctors. A lot of times they go to plastic surgeons specifically, and they say, that other guy doesn't know what he was doing. I can cut it out. I can put all these different layers in it. I can make it heal better. And I tell these patients, you know, you're more than welcome to try that, but my guess is it's going to heal up the same. And lo and behold, it almost always does. There are some instances where you can, you know, make a scar like this uh, smaller, but if it's someone who just heals, you know, with a, with a large scar all the way around, um, if, if it's, it's someone where they have a history of scarring like this, it's just their physiology. There's not a lot you could do. So this patient came to me because he wanted to do more work. He wanted to get more grafts, and he also wanted to try to revise his prior scar. And normally I would have said, you know, forget revising the prior scar. We can get out more grafts with strip, um, but that scar is going to heal up the same. You know, so maybe FUE, maybe we just sort of accept the scar and work on it later. The only reason uh, that I did sort of an excision and closure with this patient is because we were going to do this for the porphyrin treatment. So what I did with this uh, gentleman is he had a scar basically just in the back. So we took from, uh, we took basically strip to get grafts, do a little bit more on the top from each side without treating with vertiporfin. Then I cut out sections in the back and I left little what we call scar bridges in between. But we took out sections in the back and we treated these different sections with vertiporfin with different concentrations, different dosages or volumes of vertiporfin and saw what happened. So what I'm going to show now is the 12 months or the one year update of one segment of this patient's scar. 
Now this is the segment that I treated with the highest concentration I used that day of vertiporfin. And I think what we're seeing now is that that, that definitely is probably the way to go. Um, I think that there's definitely going to be a point where you get limiting returns. Um, the animal models even showed that maybe there's going to be some negative you know, aspects and maybe, maybe some negative unintended consequences if you go too high with the vertiporfin. But I think that what I'm doing here, what I did in this patient, or maybe a little bit higher is probably sort of sweet zone for it. So um, this patient just sort of, you know, without provocation, sent me this picture. And I'm going to show... Um, this picture now with a side-by-side -side of what his scar looked like after his prior FUT. So you're going to see what just a very uniform hypertrophic scar. You can see it's not like one part stretch, one part didn't. It was just a big scar all the way around. And I'm going to show it next to the vertiporfin revised uh, segment at 12 months. Now, I think that if I showed the revised 12 month scar without any sort of explanation, people would say, eh, it's a scar. You know, it's maybe not even a great strip scar, but it's a scar. But I think when you put it in context and when we, we sort of, you know, remind the viewer here that uh, without vertiporfin, I, I never would have even attempted to do this patient's revision this way because it would have healed up the same. I think it's, it's pretty impressive. So let's jump into that now. So what we see here, so the image on the left uh, is the patient's scar prior to our surgery here. And as you can see, it's a hypertrophic scar. There's no two ways about it. I would say that scar is probably about a centimeter. Um, you can see that it is all that that very, very kind of desolate, um, hard, you know, avascular, almost like dead scar tissue. On the other side, on the right, is the 12-month revision with the vertiporfin. And keep in mind that I didn't do, you know, any sort of trichophytic closure here. I didn't do any sort of, of deep sutures or anything like that, you know, because I purposely wanted this to be as, as unbiased and, you know, remove as many uh, confounding variables as we could. So with that image on the right is just 12 months. I just excised a portion, injected the highest concentration of vertiporfin and used uh, staples to staple it closed. And that's how we healed up. So as we're looking at this here, um, I think this is pretty dramatic just in and of itself. I'm not saying that, you know, we haven't seen images of scar revisions online that work this well. What I will say is that I don't think there's any way anybody possibly could have gotten this result without adding in vertiporfin. I just, my, my sincere belief, and I'll kind of back this up in a moment, my sincere belief is that if we would have gone in, excised that, used, you know, two layers of deep sutures underneath and sutures or staples on the surface, on a trichophytic closure, I still think it would have filled up wide. I just think that's that patient's physiology. But with the vertiporfin, what we see here is a very different story. You know, we see again this scar that's kind of amorphic. You know, it doesn't have this very, very big, what we call like a hairless defect. It's just very symmetric and, and, and obvious kind of in your face. This is more of kind of like an amorphic shape to it. There's also a mixture of what looks more like kind of healthy skin tissue, particularly the stuff you can kind of see at the bottom there. There's that darker kind of healthy skin tissue mixed with fibrotic tissue. And there also seems to be some, you know, activity growing in it. It's, it's hard to say whether those follicles are you know, new follicles coming from the center of it, whether they're kind of coming from the periphery. But I mean, when you compare it to the other one, you can see that this looks much more alive. There's much more happening here. You know, this is a different story. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna go into like kind of like a close up here where you can just see it. You know, this is the exact same shot, just a little bit closer. So again, a little bit more of what I was referring to. And finally here, just sort of, you know, an analysis of what I've been explaining here. A few uh, last things here. When the patient sent me the 12 month update, he also just kind of gave me some commentary about, you know, what was been going on. And he said that the way it, one of the most surprising things to him is the way that it feels back there. He said prior to this, when he would reach back there, he could obviously find that scar in a second. You know, it was, it felt odd to him. It felt kind of like, you know, a, a, a non-living scar tissue uh, part of, of him that just felt off. Um, and he also said that he could feel it was very thickened. Um, when he reaches back there and he says he touches the vertiporfin area, the vertiporfin treated area, he said it's much harder to find. Um, he also said that it, it feels thinner um, and he said it moves and it kind of palpates like normal skin, um, which is, is very interesting because I think that that's sort of what we see there is there's, there's sort of this mixture of normal tissue. So, um, you know, this is the kind of the final update of our first round of vertiporfin. So um, I, I will do more videos on this. We'll kind of go into to greater detail and again, I'll get into this in a moment. Um, but I think just sort of wrapping up this study, what we saw was that um, the higher concentrations of vertiporfin uh, did better. I think there's there's a few concentrations that we tried that it just wasn't enough. I think the higher concentration, probably about where I did it here, maybe a little bit higher, is likely going to do the most. 
Um, and I also think that it's 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 pretty safe to say that vertiporfin is doing something. You know, this was our, our kind of first try at it, so I think it was very unlikely that we were going to get it perfect and knock it out of the park on the first round. Um, so who knows, you know, exactly what this may do when we kind of refine our, our you know, um, usage of it a bit. But I think it's pretty clear that it does something. You know, the, the, the results that we saw in the animal studies appear to have translated to humans. You know, it's uh, clearly the medication is doing something here. Um, you know, what that is, how far we can push it, um, you know, I think that's still sort of uh, is, is yet to be seen. But, uh, you know, I'm encouraged. And, and because of what we've seen here, because of what I've discussed with some of my other colleagues, I'm definitely going to continue, you know, working with it. I've, I've done a few things with vertiporfin since uh, this trial. Um, and we're, we're kind of working on ways to get the medication and uh, make it a little bit more accessible to patients so we can do more of these little observational studies here. But uh, this was the conclusion of that. So a few things. So like I would mentioned earlier in the video, you know, if you are here wondering where my wet comb through hair transplant results are, um, you know, rest assured it's, it's going to be back to business as usual after this video. Um, I'll get back to just more of kind of the hair transplant stuff. And um, what I also want to announce is that I'm, I'm going to work on a second channel here. Um, and I'm going to put a link to that channel probably up here and definitely in the, um, the description of the video. And what I want to do on that channel, it's it's just going to be like a hair science channel. You know, it's it's going to discuss things more like vertiporfin, you know, other sort of futuristic treatments, medication, stuff that's not quite as, as you know, specifically related to surgery. I want to keep this channel, um, you know, our surgical practice channel very focused on the hair transplants. So um, that other channel I can kind of, you know, veer off a little bit and talk about stuff that I'm very passionate about. I, I, I find the the uh, science of, of, you know, hair loss, hair restoration, fascinating. I think that probably comes across in the videos that I'm a bit of a hair nerd. Um, so that channel uh, is, is going to be just kind of a cool, interesting one. You know, it's going to be a little bit more casual um, and sort of discussing kind of a broader array of topics, but all related to hair, hair loss, hair restoration. So it's going to be called Medical Hair Sciences. Um, and again, I'll include some, some information about it here. And one of the videos I'm going to do there is going to be, you know, sort of where we are now with vertiporfin, what we've seen, and where we're kind of going to go with it. So uh, if that sort of stuff sounds interesting, please subscribe to that channel. Please look out for that. Um, if you're here for the hair transplants, I'm going to keep working on the, you know, hair transplant related videos, the result videos here. But um, in conclusion, you know, this is now sort of the wrap up of our uh, vertiporfin study. And thank you to everyone who has sort of watched the entire time. Thank you very much to my patients that participated in it. Thank you very much to all the colleagues who have helped me out. Um, you know, this has been very exciting. This has been very fun, and I'm you know, eager to do more with it. Um, so thank you guys specifically for watching this video. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Uh, I am Dr. Blake Bloxham, and I will see you in the next one.